Hello, everyone. It's Blockchain Noob. Today, we have an interview with Trent, that is co founder of BigchainDB and Ocean Protocol. Hello, Trent. Hello. Hi. Good to have you. So, we will talk with Trent about his projects and about the future of decentralization. If you have any questions during the interview, you can write them in the chat and I will read them to Trent at the end of the interview. So Trent, are you ready to start? My pleasure. Okay, so maybe let's start with Big Chain DB. Uh, how you discovered this <clears throat> this idea and what problem it's it, it is solving? Right. All right. Um, maybe I'll give sort of a two minute intro because everything connects. Um, I spent almost twenty years doing um, AI. Um, or designing computer chips, mostly um, creative AI, helping drive Moore's law, this sort of thing, um, at scale too. Um, you know, with where there is like a thousand plus machines running to solve even one problem. Um, and uh, in, I learned about Bitcoin in 2010. You know, bought a little bit even then. Um, yeah, not very much though. Um, and uh, uh, and then in 2013, uh, I had just moved to Berlin and started thinking a lot more about blockchain. You know, the community there was actually pretty advanced in terms of thinking that way. And um, Started getting really excited about blockchain. Real, um, the implications became very clear. Um, I was kind of kicking myself for not thinking more about the blockchain side more, like what made Bitcoin tick. But um, it led me down the path where um, I started exploring uh, this question in the art world of um, how do you collect digital art? And that was actually an elephant in the room problem. And we asked the question, what if you could own digital art the way that you own Bitcoin? Turned out to be a good question to ask. And um, that uh, we from that we built something called Describe um, throughout um, 2013, 2014, released it in production in early 2015, um, and you know that's been going well. You know we targeted towards digital artists, like artists creating digital art. You know there's more than 10,000 users there, um, including many leading digital artists, um, museums, etc., like the National Museum of Singapore. But we yeah, ran into a one lot of time. So it sounds. Yeah. My thing sounds. There will be a problem with scalability on Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. This is all built on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, actually, right? And it's still, you know, we, we keep running it and um, supporting it and so on. Um, and we really targeted this, you know, relatively small community, but influential, right? These leading digital artists. And art is a, you know, a big industry. Um, one of my co-founders is a professional curator, works at the Louvre, all that. Um, so with that, though, we ran into uh, a major issue, and that was the, the scalability um, of Bitcoin. Um, you know, we were looking to bring on marketplaces for photography and whatnot. You know, and even a medium-sized marketplace has 100,000 photos a day. And um, if we were to um, put that onto Bitcoin, it would, it would have been doubling the number of transactions of the whole Bitcoin blockchain in one day. And at the time, it was 10 cents per transaction. So um, it would have been costing $10,000 just to make, you know, 10,000 entries in, in a database, right? Yeah. Um, imagine, you know, if you, you know, so that's very, very expensive for a database. So we thought, well, you know, um, Surely there's a better way to engineer this for the needs we have, right? And we, we looked around and we talked to friends building various blockchains, but none of them were really targeting scale. You know, this was um, mid-2014, uh, sorry, mid-2015. We were thinking about it even going back to early 2014. We saw, started to see the issues then, but it actually got in the way of what we were trying to accomplish by mid-2015. And that's what led us down the path of um, big chain DB. And we, we said, you know, there's all this big data, um, databases out there. Right, like MongoDB and Cassandra and so on. Uh, why is none of that technology being leveraged for scale in the blockchain world? And we see that blockchains, um, you can frame blockchains as simply databases uh, with some new characteristics, you know, decentralized, immutable, and so on. So we went on that path and basically adapted MongoDB to be decentralized. And that's basically what BigchainDB is. It's leveraging the best of MongoDB or Rethink and um, giving it these new characteristics, um, decentralized, um, and so on. So that was basically Big Chain DB. Uh, we released that in early 2016. And uh, also, um, within a few months, we announced and have been um, slowly rolling out IPDB, which is a public net. So, and to us, that's really, really crucial, right? Um, there's the software, but you also really need the network and the protocol. And that's really what IPDB is, the interplanetary database. Um, so it's, basically, we So it's like the public ledger of Big Chain DB. Uh, yes, exactly. It's, it's the public instance, right? Um, and overall, we don't really use the word ledger. It's sort of like, you know, a database is a very specific thing. It stores data, but in a structured way. And then it has excellent querying, right? So you actually can 
you have queries and it returns results very, very quickly. And you don't have out of the box querying with, with sort of a ledger or, or a spreadsheet and whatnot, right? Those are more just like simple CSV files. Um, and that's different than also blob storage, uh, where it's storing you know, big data blobs. So you've got things like in the centralized world, things like S3, um, Amazon S3 for storing data blobs, or decentralized things like um, IPFS with Filecoin. Um, so, so that's a very different thing than in the decentralized world, where you've got things like um, for databases, uh, you know, the decentralized MongoDB, decentralized Cassandra, all of this. And this is what BigChainDB is about, right? And you know, similarly, um, you've got things like um, uh, Ethereum, which are decentralized processing, basically, to, to do actually to run scripts, et cetera. All these things are complementary, right? IPFS, IPDB, and Ethereum. It, it's three pieces of a decentralized compute stack. Okay, so in one sentence, BigchainDB is a decentralized database with some uh, blockchain features, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a database with blockchain characteristics, basically. Yeah, yeah but uh, there is no like currency in in BigchainDB. Uh, that's correct. Yes, yes. Yeah, it, it, you can actually issue your own um, tokens on top. You know, you can call them a currency. You can call them whatever you want, and lots of people do various things like that, right? Um, just like on top of Ethereum, people can issue their own tokens using ERC20, et cetera. Um, BigChainDB also supports that in a single call with you know your JavaScript client or your Python client. You can create your own assets, um, ten of them. Okay, that them. Sounds, sounds interesting. So let's assume that I want to create my token based on BigChainDB. And I just want to use the token as a currency. And yeah. uh, so how people will be able to use this currency? There are some wallets, or I have to create the wallets for them? Uh, yeah, so overall, um, if you want to get started just playing with it, um, you can go to bigchainDB.com or IPDB.io, and there's a get started, you, there's a button for get started. And you can just type in, like, hello world, and you'll see in like one second, you've actually put a transaction onto IPDB, right? Um, and then, so that gives you a feel of how quickly and easy it is. Um, and that's only about like seven lines of code, you know, importing the library, um, creating a transaction where it's passing in hello world and, and so on. So that's just a very simple transaction. And um, there's really two main types of transactions in BigChain DB, and they are creating an asset and issuing an asset. So creating an asset, even in typing hello world, you're actually creating an asset where the data inside that asset is hello world. Um, so it's really, in that case, it's emphasizing the data. But other times you might say, okay, let's create an asset. Say I want, you know, one million um, uh, 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 coins total. Um, so that's just a simple one-line call. And we have tutorials, et cetera. You could get going and create that sort of thing in 15 minutes. Um, it's very straightforward. And uh, so with um, going from the, the hello world, you follow down, go through a tutorial or two, and you've got it going. And then you can have it running on IPDB right away too. So it's, it's meant to be dead simple. Um, you know, a lot of people think you need, you know, a month or two months to become an expert at, at blockchain just to use them. It's like learning about every, every last detail of an internal combustion engine just to drive a car. You don't need to, right? Uh, what you need to know is what's the interface, right? So when yeah, you download yeah. MongoDB, oh, you drive it, yeah. install it, and then you, within 10 minutes you're going, right? Same thing here. Okay, and what are the main use cases for BigChainDB? Yeah, so overall, there's a few key ones. Uh, we started with IP, intellectual property, um, you know, things like digital art, music, et cetera, making sure we supported that well, largely because that's where we came from. Um, but we've seen that the other key use, and there's a lot of people building uh, IP-related applications. Um, for uh, scarcity, if you want to say, I'm going to have 10 limited editions of art, et cetera, as well as simply for licensing. Licensing photographs, even if you have an unlimited number of editions. Um, and provenance, sort of what's the history of ownership of this piece of art. Um, these things also um, translate extremely well to supply chain applications. So that's another major application where um, you've got, say, uh, a big car manufacturer that is 3D printing parts in China, and uh, they want to make sure that fraud isn't happening. So, um, so basically, as soon as that part is manufactured, then um, it gets its own unique ID. And as it gets transported um, uh, you know, in boats to North America, to Europe, et cetera, then, um, then you actually have a unique ID, and you can just track where that is. Um, and in this case, you can actually tie it with um, uh, means of unique identification physically itself with chips or otherwise. Um, so we have partners that we work with on that. Um, so that, that's a second example. Um, also in the energy space, um, 
uh, and other spaces too. Data is, is related to IP as well with Ocean and stuff. Um, but IP and supply chain are probably, you know, the two most important applications. Okay, okay. Uh, and this one more that I forgot, uh, sorry, is identity. So people where it's towards, um, you know, claiming uh, a piece of your digital identity and, and you know, um, managing your own personal data, all that, um, health data, et cetera. Um, uh, Big Chini B is well suited to that, um, in particular because it has a really um, uh, rich permissioning system where you can make it where only certain people have certain roles to, to read your data, to write, and so on. Okay, and my last question about Big Chain DB. Uh, mm -hmm. If I want to use it, this is the free software, or I or they have to pay a license to you? How it how it works from the business side? Yeah, uh, fully free. It's a GPL licensed, which is um, you know a standard license that many open source projects use, from Rethink to Mongo to many more. Um, and uh, that's that's the server side. The uh, the client side software is um, all Apache two, which is uh, an even more permissive license. So um, you know, free to use all that. We have uh, support for developers uh, on on Gitter, um, and that's linked directly from the homepage of bigchindb.com. As well, you know, if people do want to do a bit more enterprise -y deployments, then we have um, a business development team with application engineers that we engage with for that. Um, Overall, you know, so people can deploy their own networks, um, you know, within an enterprise or consortium. Although, like uh, we see, uh, and our vision is really the majority of use cases um, on IPDB itself. Um, you know, we really want to keep driving the public nets. That's the uh, the best thing for the the future of, of civilization. Okay, okay. that's nice. Let's move to the Ocean Protocol. Uh, yeah. Your website says this is the decentralized exchange for data. Can you tell mm -hmm. something more about this and how you get to this idea? Sure. So um, overall, this kind of uh, you know taking a step back. Uh, if you look around the world today, um, you you know we all have social media accounts in Facebook and Twitter and so on, right? Yeah. And we've seen that, especially in the last five years, that these organizations that were once medium-sized and perhaps benevolent have become much much larger, the most powerful corporation on the, pa on the planet. And it's clear that some of these things are really affecting us negatively as individuals as well as a civilization. You know, the Trump election um, issues are just one simple example, but there are many, many more, right? And they can kick you out any time, right? And then you're, you're not linked. Um, so, you know, when you sign up, you're basically passing over your data to them, and you, you no, can no longer directly control it. And they're selling it to people, right? So uh, Facebook themselves buys data from 150 other suppliers, right? Um, and they, they, they probably know more about you than you know yourself. Um, this is, you know, super unhealthy for society, for democracy, uh, yeah, and so on. It's scary, yeah. yeah. And, and so we've asked ourselves, like, how do you approach this, right? And there have been things where people build, like, a decentralized Twitter, a decentralized Facebook, and those are wonderful efforts. Um, but we, did, we realized there's an, an, another way to attack, approach this. You know, those efforts, they're, they're challenging. We realized that a lot of this comes down to um, AI and who owns what data and so on. So given that we came from, the, like, I came from the AI world and so, several of my colleagues, um, uh, you really, you know, it's AI that's taking this raw data and then turning that into value, value for Facebook to sell more ads, value for Google to sell more ads, et cetera, right? So what can we do to um, accomplish two goals? One of them, the main goal is to give people back control of their data. Um, and um, related to that, to promote a fully public data commons where the data that can be open is out there, easy to use. And we see that the way to do that is, um, is via uh, Right now, a market that's missing, there's a whole bunch of um, enterprises that have tons of data, but they don't know how to, to sell it. Um, it's just sitting there. They don't know how to handle privacy, all of that. And then you have all these AI startups, these AI experts who don't have a lot of data, um, but, they, but they have tons of AI expertise. And the idea of Ocean is basically to create a medium for them to talk to each other. And that can create a lot of value because the AI startups then have a lot more data. Um, as individuals, we can eventually um, start to give permission to use that data to these different um, uh, channels uh, as people wish. And that, in, that, in, that fashion, um, in that fashion, you can actually turn off control every, anytime you want. Imagine if rather than saying, uh, going to Facebook and saying, hey, I want to delete my account, please delete everything, you just remove permissions and then they can't see it, right? So it's much more about self-sovereign data. So going back to Ocean, what Ocean is about is uh, it's a protocol to facilitate um, data halves and AI halves, um, people with a lot of data and people with AI expertise. And 
it's not a marketplace itself. Instead, what it allows is for um, dozens, hundreds, thousands of marketplaces to bloom that connect the data halves and the AI halves. Um, and those data halves can be individuals. Those data halves can be big enterprises. Right? Um, so the, the analogy we like to use is, um, like in the uh, airline industry, you have something called, um, um, called Amadeus and Sabre. And what they are is uh, an underlying database that stores all the different um, airline flights that are being offered by all the different airlines. So the airlines populate that database that's shared by the whole industry. And then um, other websites make that available to buy, whether it's kayak.com to explore lots of them, or Expedia, or airberlin.com, or whatever, right? So uh, Ocean is kayak for data. Sorry, Ocean is Sabre for data. On top, market, you know, we envision a flowering of marketplaces to, to buy and sell databases, data in various ways. Um, but Ocean itself, the emphasis is not about the buying and selling. It's actually about um, making that data available with really great controls over privacy, et cetera. So yeah, at the same time, exactly. uh, how does privacy work? So uh, yeah. let's assume I, I'm the AI company and mm -hmm. I buy some data from that is, that is, that is for me. So can I download yeah. the data or just run my model to learn on this data, but I cannot take it? Yeah, it depends, on, it depends on the data set. So there's some data that's OK. Um, if, it's, you know, if you download it and, and start using it, like, for example, some aspects of self-driving car data, right, or weather data, or yeah. stock data, that's fine. Um, but other data, like say, um, like health um, records, right? Um, that cannot leave German soil, for example, right? Um, like if you if you if you have health data in Germany, you cannot leave German soil, and that's according to data protection laws. And a lot of countries are like that. So um, you need to what you need to do is um, support these various um, use cases. And a way to frame it is: where does the compute exist? It could exist client side. So you buy the data, you download it, and you use it on your side, and you munge it however you want to munge it with AI however you want. Or you can have it client side, right? Sorry, you can have it on the side of the data, um, so the server side. Um, so in this case, uh, what you're doing is actually you're bringing um, the, the compute to the data itself, and the compute happens there, and then you only get the result. Okay. So you're paying um, basically for um, one of your algorithms or some other licensed algorithm to go on the, um, on premise um, where the data is to do some computation and then send the results to you. And so Ocean is actually, um, we're, we're designing it to support um, both aspects of this, um, both the um, on-premise compute as well as the, the client-side compute. OK, and my next question is about motivation of this company to, to sell the data. Yeah. Uh, if, I, if I think about this, I think like when they have the market where there is like many medium players, they can share because they also need uh, data. So they think yeah. if they each other, the profit will be for the entire industry. But yeah. if you're talking for like for the big players like Google or Facebook, yeah. they earn a lot of money based on this data. And yeah. probably there is no price that someone else can pay that to, to yeah. get the data. Yeah, so um, I'm going to uh, talk about this twofold. I'll talk about um, you know, um, players that aren't Google and Facebook, and then I'll talk about Google and Facebook. And with players that aren't Google and Facebook, I'll, I'll use a very specific example to start. Um, Toyota Research Institute, TRI. So um, TRI is researching self-driving cars, as is Daimler and all the other big players, and Uber, et cetera. And what they've discovered is that um, to get their self-driving technology accurate enough, they need about 500 billion to 1 tri trillion miles driven, right? So the AI you know, models themselves, like the, the learning algorithms, don't even need to change. They just need, need a lot more data. And they've discovered that it's way too expensive for them to get on their own, right? Um, or if they did, it would take 15 or 20 years. But if they had a way to pool all the data now together, uh, or in the next year, then um, they could actually get to an accuracy very, very soon. Um, and it's a win for everyone across the board, rather than duplicating efforts. The thing is, they're big enterprises. It's not like they're all going to hug and sing kumbaya, right? They need some sort of medium that allows them to buy and sell with each other, et cetera. And that's what Ocean um, is a, a perfect substrate for, where they can connect using Ocean and you know, marketplaces on top, right, as the medium, respecting the different data privacy laws, et cetera, on, of course, yeah. too, and the regulations. So, um, so, and that's actually kind of a win across the board. It means we get self-driving cars much sooner, which then reduces you know, all these auto fatalities, driving fatalities that we have every year, you know, 1.2 million deaths in the US alone per year. Yeah, um, it's, it's just like everyone is winning. The, the yeah, industry, the right. consumers, everything. Yeah, yeah. 
Exactly. So, so this is a great example, and we actually have been working closely with Toyota on this um, to, to help drive this out. Uh, and Toyota, as well as other um, folks in the auto industry. Um, you know, another example is medical data, right? Right now, you know, um, even here in Berlin, each hospital has its own data silo. They don't share data back and forth. So if I visit a new hospital with an issue, um, I have to tell them from memory what my data is or somehow bring that along with me, but that's really inconvenient because I have to, they would print it out and then have to scan it and so on. But imagine instead where um, I could just um, give them permission to read my data that's already um, stored um, privately um, on my own premise or on a, on a um, USB stick or something, right? So that's one framing of the medical side, but the other side is what about medical research, right? Normally, uh, if people are building a, a model of say, you know, whether or not someone has Parkinson's, right? Then maybe they have 10,000 or 100,000 data points, um, you know, from, you know, a slice of people living in a city or something, right? But imagine if you had access to t like way more, the data sets of a huge number of hospitals spread throughout the globe. Um, this, you know, this is possible, but you have to ha address the privacy and data um, issues. Um, and the cool thing is this is now possible because of, um, you know, developments in the technology where you can bring the on-premise compute, update, um, you know, one hospital at a time, um, do the learning such that um, even though the model that's being built um, stays secure and private, such that the yeah, final result... Yeah, it's very promising that it can speed up research a lot. Um, yeah. But yeah. what about this more tough uh, use cases with big players? Yeah, yeah, it's for sure. So this is basically uh, all, everyone except for Google and Facebook and whatnot, right? So Google and Facebook actually, and a, few, a couple others, they recognized 10 years ago now about the importance of data. They were way ahead of the curve. And what they've been doing in the last 10 years is um, building these gigantic data moats. That is the heart of their business, right? It yeah. is data. They, they call themselves algorithm companies, but that's just like an AI companies. That's just a head fake. It's really about the data. The algorithms are the commodity. The data is the moat, right? And frankly, um, that, and they're accumulating like crazy. Um, we need to get rid of this, frankly. We need to chop this down, right? We need to pull down the, those, those moats. So they have zero interest in um, getting rid of their data moats, right? Um, because that compromises the heart of their business. Yeah, so, exactly. This is, so frankly, my view is um, we need to actually um, run around that, right? Um, maybe they'll see value at some point. Um, you know, maybe they'll tokenize themselves and serve the communities better. But I'm not counting on that in the near term. So uh, Ocean, frankly, is targeted to democratize data um, away from the centralization from the likes exactly of Google and Facebook. They're, they're not going to like it, frankly. And yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, we are preparing for war, basically, right? The, the strikes at the very heart of, of Google and Facebook. And I'm okay with that, right? You know, I've done battle with big players before and succeeded. Um, I, I have no problem doing it again. You do it based on values, based on technology, based uh, on drive. Nice, nice approach. Yeah. Yeah, so. and my next question is about entire decentralization movement, yeah. the blockchain industry. Uh, what is, in your opinion, the current state of the blockchain industry? And what are the biggest challenges for decentralization in next months and year? Right. Uh, so overall, um, it's hard to really define a current state. But I think you know, one big learning of the last year or two is um, more in the industry have recognized the value and the power of the public nets over the private nets, right? And I think that's a really, really healthy development. Um, you know, we've seen that for a long time. And um, we're happy that a lot of the industry has, uh, is recognizing this. So, you know, a lot of these um, proofs of concepts within banks and whatnot have kind of faded away, whereas the rise of the, the public net has taken off. You know, ICOs are a great example of that. Obviously, there's a lot of negative stuff about certain ICOs with scams and whatnot, but there's some really high quality stuff happening too, right? Um, and you know, uh, the, like, do you invest in ICOs? Do I invest in ICOs? Um, yeah. I really focus my energy on. Um, building Ocean and Big Chain to be. And to me, this is in the greater context of sort of a next phase for civilization, right? So, um, and what do I mean by that is, I see that, you know, we've had, you know, broadly speaking, civilization, we had things like the agricultural revolution and first industrial, second industrial revolution. Yeah. revolution. And now, um, you know, with, with InfoTech, uh, the information revolution, we started with the internet, which is really like a public utility, right? Um, it's sort of like nature, um, in a sense. It's sort of out there, um, everyone can access it, um, et cetera, et cetera. And now, you know, um, thanks to um, tokenized, decentralized infrastructure, 
we're seeing that we can actually build many layers on top of that, right? Not just about you know connecting networks like TCP IP, IP did, or connecting documents like World Wide Web, but also decentralizing um, storage like Filecoin, decentralizing data itself like Ocean, um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there's you know many many building blocks, you know 20, 50, 500 building blocks um, that can be sort of layered on top, sort of a nature 2.0, if you will. And um, there, there's core ones getting built right now, and you know, IPDB and Ocean are two of these. You know, the database and, and the data protocol um, for for the value of data itself, right? So, within that context, um, you know, this is my framing, and it's not a widely spread idea yet, um, but I see that it's an important one. Um, and so, within the framing that 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 I have, the sort of like call it a civilization dig, a sort of map of where we can head. Um, there are um, projects out there that are helping toward this. I mentioned some like Filecoin and, and, and Ocean. There's, there's several others as well, right, that I think are quite important. Um, you know, most recently we had Polkadot, for example. That's a key piece too, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, so in terms of the broader blockchain field, um, you know, the ICO stuff, a lot of the scam stuff will go away. It won't be as overheated, but what will remain is people realizing that, you know, civilization is advancing in a very healthy way. And also, you know, the nature of the, the organization, you know, um, with Coast Theorem and all this, the, the enterprise doesn't need to be so big and daunting. And instead, we have not just, you know, with decentralization and tokens, we have not just a way to fund open source projects, but we have a new ways to organize um, tribes of humans uh, in a way that's actually where they can feed their families and move forward. And even, you know, things like unlocking UBI, there's now a path, right? Yeah, this is like discovering the new land, the un new universe. Yeah. And my next question is uh, about DAOs, because it is mm -hmm. also quite a promising part of decentralization. Yeah. Uh, at the first sight, when you just heard about the DAOs, you see so many possibilities when you can use it. But when you go deeper in that, you see that, that from my perspective, there is a very big problem with that, because DAO can work quite fine, if it interacts with other DAOs in the blockchain. But mm -hmm. if you have to have some interaction with normal words, there is like the big problem. Yeah. Do you have the idea how to solve this problem? Do we have to move everything on blockchain to have good DAOs, or maybe there is another way? Uh, there's other ways. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, humans are messy. The real world is a bit messy, but there are, um, uh, there's connective tissue, right? Um, uh, and some of the very basic things, people are starting to, there's this idea of oracles where you can bring data from the real world into um, uh, blockchain ecosystems, call them DAOs, call them um, tokenized networks, whatever. Um, and, uh, but then, you know, what about when people start acting badly um, inside a blockchain? Right now, people treat it like a zero sum game where if you hack it, then you get the money, right? Because that's yeah. the rules of the game. But that's kind of um, against the principles of decentralization and so on in a sense, right? Like a community. Um, there's another way of thinking about it, and you know I have to thank Ian Grigg for framing it this way. Um, you know, a blockchain visionary. Um, you can have win-win, but what you need to do is to have um, the rules of the game set out such that there actually is legal recourse, le legal binding. Um, so you have a blockchain constitution, which is actually a contract of how to behave. And um, if people actually misbehave according to the the um, the agreed upon rules in that contract, where they agree when they join. Um, then you actually can have legal teeth behind it, things like third-party arbitration and even the courts, right? And um, you know, Ian actually developed something called Ricardian contracts back in the late '90s um, that that actually um, addressed this. And we've actually even used those in the early days with the Scribe IP and the blockchain stuff. And what this means is, you know, um, uh, if you do something that's against, basically, when you when you do something on the blockchain, you're actually digitally signing, agreeing to a given contract. And that contract has, you know, real world legal teeth, right? So you've got third party arbitration, legals, et cetera, to kind of connect. That's a starting point for the legals. It's actually an important one. There's going to be other connections too, right? And over time, um, you know, I think we'll just see this blending, you know, where does uh, the sort of virtual um, uh, slash electronic um, end and the world of atoms uh, begin? You know, how do you, connecting atoms and bits, that line will blur. Yeah, and from one side, the blockchain can be, a, let's say, a tool of freedom because of decentralization, trustless, and so on. But when you look uh, deeper and you 
assume that at some point the adoption of blockchain will be global, everyone will use blockchain, and the government will take care about this, then the blockchain can be last of, like the tool for Big Brother, because you see every transaction on the blockchain, for example, yeah. or, and then like taxation, for example, can be done automatically. Yeah. And if uh, government want to, if the government, the government control the, the blockchain, let's say the government will decide to be the, the biggest miners of Bitcoin. Yeah. And they have like, let's say United Nations decide, we, we don't like this country, so we decide to ban all transactions from this country. And obviously, this country is fucked. There is like, yeah, so, no yeah. other way, because there is no cash. Uh, so I'm also afraid of the te blockchain technology. And the same have, have with the China, when there is maybe not the blockchain, but there is no like no cash. And the government is controlling the transaction. There is like ranking of the citizens, like yeah. in the Black Mirror uh, show. Are you also afraid of this kind of situations? Uh, certainly, like right now, um, you could see that um, like overall technology is always a double-edged sword, and some technology is much more double-edged than others, right? Um, you know, um, and probably the two biggest double-edged swords right now that we're confronting in society are blockchain and, a and AI, right? Um, there's huge potential gains for society, but also huge potential risks, right? Um, and so with blockchain, you know, it really comes down to what direction we head, and this is why it's really important to talk about this and make sure that we do try to bias towards the things that um, can be positive for society, like paint that positive picture and then start to um, show um, the steps that we need to take to get to the positive picture of humanity rather than accidentally veering towards this negative picture, right? And there's always going to be tension and whatnot, but um, it's totally possible. And there's, you know, specific tactics that we can take, for example, engaging with governments in open dialogue, you know, um, you know, developer technology develops a little more slowly than most technologists like to say, and governments, it turns out, are actually moving faster in making laws um, than anyone expected, actually, and, and often in healthy ways, right? You know, we, we work with uh, the Singapore government, with the Estonian government, with others, and um, it's really healthy engagements, right? Um, so there are forward-thinking nations that will help to pay, show the way for the rest. But I think it's really important to build bridges, um, not to run away from the law and not to call it illegal. Like, fact of the matter is, you li live in a world where there's um, laws that have been developed Maybe some of them are silly, but they're still there. And but you work with the lawmakers to co-develop the laws with the technology towards a brighter humanity, right? Um, it's as simple as that. Um, yes, there's going to be still dark things that happen, but we can uh, work to build the future we want, right? So let's let's have the courage to imagine this positive future and then work towards it. Okay, thank you very much. That was my last question. Thank you for the time you spent with us. For the very interesting interview, and I wish you good luck with your fight with the big players for decentralized data. Thank you very much. See Thank you. you. Bye.